Well, you can join me now in opening up your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. And if you want to grab a Bible nearby under a seat, if you don't have one, you can find Romans 8 on page 944 in those Bibles. And if you don't happen to own a Bible um, and would like one, please do just take that one uh, that you're using from under seat nearby. We'd love for you to have a copy of God's Word to read to hear His voice uh, for yourself as well. So we're continuing this series in Romans 8 here, and we're seeing this powerful combination of two realities that we can often tend to separate. We're seeing how real Christianity brings together doctrine and experience. It brings together clear thinking about gospel doctrine or theology or truth and true experience and life in the Holy Spirit. And this morning's text addresses the topic of how change is possible. Can we actually please God? Can we actually grow for the better in obedience? By obedience, I mean all the ways that the Bible refers to growth as a Christian. So when we're thinking about change, transformation, obedience this morning, we're thinking about everything the Bible refers to. So radical life change, transformation, becoming more like Jesus in His character, sanctification, growing in holiness, and so forth. The language in the context here in Romans 8 is fulfilling the law, the heart of which is love. So the question is, is this possible? And here's what Romans 8 says. This is impossible before you become a Christian, and then it becomes inevitable. But how? How is it that obedience shifts from impossible to not just possible, but inevitable? Because when someone becomes a Christian, a radical God-given and performed transformation takes place at the core of your personality, at the core of who you are. Before you become a Christian, true obedience is impossible. After you become a Christian, it's not only possible but inevitable. Now, some Christians don't think that real change is possible. Other Christians think that it's possible but not inevitable. And many people who aren't Christians don't think that real Christianity makes a net positive difference in life at all. But what I'm going to show from this text is according to the Bible itself, when someone becomes a Christian, they experience a radical transformation and a new trajectory of obedience to Jesus. So Romans chapter 8 verses 5 to 8 explain this massive shift with a set of contrasts. And these contrasts explain how obedience shifts from impossible to inevitable. So let's read these verses and then pray together and then consider them more closely. Romans 8, verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your true and good and beautiful word. And so we pray that by the power of your spirit, you would do what only you can do. Help us think rightly, feel rightly, and live more like your glory as it's seen in Jesus. Amen. Okay, so here's a way to think about transformation. Imagine a new world full of life and peace, and joy, and harmony. Apostle Paul says later in this chapter, that world is coming. And every Christian has this seed planted in them that will grow toward that coming future in the consummation and new creation to come. We are already beginning to grow in that direction. 
Paul uses a set of contrasts to explain the difference between life before the radical turning point of conversion or becoming a Christian that God brings about in someone's life and after. And there's two different categories of people with two different mindsets leading to two different destinies, and they have two different attitudes toward God. So, let's walk through each of these. There's four contrasts that Paul uses to make the case that obedience moves from an impossibility to an inevitability for every Christian. So, first, there's two categories, and every person who's ever lived it, lived, is in one category or the other. This whole section in the verses we read, the verse before it, several verses after, there's a constant contrast running through these paragraphs between what Paul calls the flesh and the spirit. You might have picked up on it when we read. Look back a verse at verse 4. He contrasted those, we saw this last week, who walk, to metaphor for living, a lifestyle, who walk according to the flesh and those who walk according to the Spirit. And then notice the contrast between flesh and spirit in verse 5. He contrasts those who live according to the flesh with those who live according to the Spirit. Verse 6, he contrasts setting the mind on the flesh with setting the mind on the Spirit. And then verses 8 and 9, he contrasts again those who are in the flesh. It's a category, in the flesh, and those who are in the Spirit. So what does he mean by flesh and spirit? Well, Paul uses the word flesh in different ways throughout his writing. Sometimes it just refers to our physical bodies, right? You have flesh on your bones. Other times, like here, flesh is a way of referring to our sinful human nature. Our human nature became fundamentally self-centered when sin entered the world. And so flesh is a way of referring to this self-oriented way of thinking, feeling, living. The Spirit refers to the Holy Spirit the second person of the Trinity. If the realm of the flesh is ruled by selfishness, the realm of the Spirit is ruled by the Holy Spirit. And here's what Paul is saying. Every person is in one category or the other. Look at verse 5 again. He contrasts those who are of the flesh and those who are of the Spirit. This isn't always clear in the translation, so I'm using the ESV, and it says, those who live according to the flesh Your text may say something like that. And those who live according to the Spirit. Um, But that phrase, those who live, could make us think in terms of lifestyle or behavior or way of life, right? But he's speaking more fundamentally. It's hard to translate, but the language he's using is ontological. So it could be translated something like those who are according to the Spirit and those who are according to the flesh. He's explaining the difference between two categories of people, and he keeps this contrast going through the next couple paragraphs. So, one of the clearest ways he puts it in verses 8 and 9. So, look at the language there. He says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And then in verse 9, he says, you, however, speaking of Christians, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. So, the flesh and the spirit are like two different realms. Everyone is born into the realm of the flesh. Everyone is, comes into life from conception onward in the flesh, and then when we become Christians, we're transferred into the realm of the spirit. Um, He's even making this argument in this, in this text that these are two categories. So, in verse 4, he does refer to a way of life. He talks about those who walk according to the flesh and spirit, and now he's going to explain why is it that some people walk according to the flesh and others walk according to the spirit? Why is it that he can just summarize Christians as those who don't walk according to the flesh and those they walk according to the spirit? And he's saying, well, here's why. Because there's two categories of people. There's two realms, and you're either of the flesh and in the flesh, or of the Spirit and in the, in the Spirit. Now, here's one reason why this is important to see. Because it was popular in the past generation or two to say that there's two kinds of Christians. They would even use texts like this, um, I think understood out of context throughout Romans 8, and said that a Christian can either be dominated by the flesh or ruled or dominated by the Spirit. Some Christians are still fleshly, and they can be called carnal or fleshly Christians. 
And other Christians aren't carnal Christians, they're spiritual Christians or spirit-filled Christians. And this became pamphlet in, or popular in a pamphlet I even remember receiving and using when I was in college in a campus ministry. It was popularized by what some, some call free grace theology or the free grace movement because some thought that if the gospel is really free, it means you can be forgiven without changing. Because if we say that there's any change that necessarily comes, then that's kind of smuggling in works into salvation. So they were so afraid of that that they ended up misunderstanding this text and many others like it. But Romans 8 shows us that God's grace is both free and powerful. We are forgiven of our sins through faith alone. There's no mistaking that. But the faith that saves is never alone. And this is because when God brings us to faith, He transforms our hearts, and He gives us the Holy Spirit. So, Paul is explaining why it is that Christians now obey God. Not perfectly, that's not what we're talking about this morning, but a new trajectory of obedience in life is created, and obedience that was once impossible becomes increasingly inevitable. So, the first part of the answer to that question, how is it that it becomes impossible to inevitable, is because there's two fundamental categories of people, those in the flesh, those in the spirit. Christians are those who are transferred out of the flesh and put into the spirit realm. Okay, second contrast, two mindsets. There's two mindsets associated with each category. Look at the contrast again in verse 5. Those who live or are according to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live or are according to the Spirit, set their minds on the things of the Spirit. This idea of setting our minds on is not just about our thinking from time to time, like we think about certain things from time to time. The word Paul uses for mind points to uh, the deepest thoughts and the direction of our wills. It's what we set our thoughts and desires on in life, our ambitions, what drives us. It's a mindset. John Stott put it this way, it's a question of what preoccupies us, of the ambitions which drive us and the concerns which engross us, how we spend our time and our energies, of what we concentrate on and give ourselves up to. So there's a mindset like this that characterizes those who are in the flesh, and there's a mindset that characterizes those who are in the spirit. So what's the mindset of the flesh. Well, remember, flesh refers to our sinful nature. It's the corrupt, self-oriented nature that we're born with. The direction of our hearts is oriented away from God and others, and it's oriented toward ourselves. Martin Luther would talk about how we're curved in on ourselves. We reject God as our creator, and we receive His gifts and put ourselves in His place. It's a self-centered approach to life. The mindset of the flesh is present, we should note, in both religious and irreligious ways of living. When Jesus came, He was critiquing this fleshly mindset when He critiqued the religious leaders who read their Bibles and wanted people to obey the Bible. And Jesus hammers them for being driven by envy and jealousy and pride and doing all of this stuff to be seen, right? They prayed publicly not because they were ultimately oriented toward God, but themselves. They wanted people to see them praying so that they would get honored, right? They gave money to help people, right? Well, maybe mixed in there for sure. What, was else, what else was going on? They wanted to be seen as someone who's generous to others. So even their goodness toward other people was ultimately self-driven, right? Jesus is going after this. So the point is that the flesh is oriented toward the self. You can avoid God by living and live for yourself by uh, disobeying his commands. You can also avoid God and live for yourself by keeping his commands at some kind of surf, surface level and showing up here on Sundays and doing all sorts of good things in the community. You can have a great work, work ethic, a good job, a nice house, a well-behaved family, and it can all be ultimately an expression deep down of a mindset that is set on the flesh. And what's the mindset of the Spirit? Well, when someone becomes a Christian, they're given a new mindset. They start affirming Fundamentally, that God is the center of the universe, not me. The Spirit cracks the foundation 
of selfishness and self-centeredness. He leads us in the moment when we're first confessing Christ, we confess Jesus is Lord. Implication, I am not. It's, it's a dethroning of the self. It's what conversion is, a dethroning of the self and an acknowledgement of the lordship of Jesus. We say we're following Jesus. That's what a disciple is. I'm going to follow Jesus, which means I'm not going to follow my heart anymore. Jesus is Lord of my heart, and my heart is now disordered, and so I submit even my desires to Him. He leads us to say, thy will be done rather than my will be done. So this second contrast is explaining also why Christians can and will now obey. So Christians have been transferred to the new realm of the Spirit, and they have a new mindset. They've been changed at the core of their being. Their self-oriented approach to life has been fundamentally changed, not perfectly, not fully, but truly. Okay, two categories with two mindsets, and this leads to the third contrast, which is two destinies. The mindset of the flesh leads to death. The mindset of the spirit leads to life and peace. This is verse 6. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. So in the beginning, first pages of the Bible, you may be familiar, what were the consequences of sin? God said, in the day that you eat of this tree, which I told you not to eat of, you will die. And from that point on, humanity comes into the world spiritually dead, in the flesh category. And then we live until we physically die, and then we face judgment and go on for eternal death. This is saying that the category of the flesh with the mindset of the flesh leads to death. This is where it's headed. It's headed away from God, which is where that mindset's oriented away from anyways. And it goes away from Him who's the giver of life. When you become a Christian, you're transferred into a new realm with a new future. You're taken out of that realm with that future, and you are put into Christ in the Spirit with a new future of life and peace. And this is totally undeserved. And it's because, as we've seen the past couple of weeks, because of the work of Jesus. The good news at the heart of the Christian message is that though we are firmly in this category of the flesh and we live for ourselves and deserve death, Jesus came to live a perfect, God oriented, others serving life. And then the cross was the place where he was taking that destiny that the flesh deserves and bearing it himself, taking our judgment upon himself. And then he's risen from the dead, demonstrating that he is the true king of the world. He was perfect. He was dying not for his own sins, but others. And then now he reigns and he pours out his spirit to transfer people from one category to another so that we share in his destiny, life and peace forever. So we're all born in the flesh, and then we get transferred into the realm of Christ and the Spirit. And in that realm, there's forgiveness and freedom. And he invites everyone then to trade in their deserved future for his deserved future. If you're a Christian, you have done this. If you are not a Christian, you are welcome to, by the power of the Spirit, to trust in Jesus and receive this new destiny and the forgiveness of your sins. Finally, this contrast reflects two attitudes. The attitude in the category of the flesh is deep resistance to God and His ways. The attitude in the category of the Spirit is, this is how we put it in one of our values as a church, glad submission to the authority of God's Word. Paul focuses on the attitude of the flesh in verses 7 and 8, and then he'll shift more to focus on the attitude of the Spirit life in verses to come that we'll consider in these coming weeks. The focus here is on the attitude of the flesh. It's one of the strongest, clearest, most striking statements on the human condition apart from Christ in the Bible. Look at verses 7 and 8. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. He gives four descriptions here of our human nature, and this is the attitude of humanity in the flesh apart from Christ. Notice first he says that it's hostile to God, which makes sense in light of what we've been seeing, right? It's hostile to God because it's oriented towards self. 
Um, it's, it's putting self as the ruler. God is submitting to our wills. So we're all born with a nature that assumes we're in charge. Our nature is bent away from God and, and is therefore anti-God. Every student at some point comes across the nature versus nurture question. Came across that at some point, high school or before or college, and write a paper on it or talk about it. And we're, you know, the question is, are we influenced by our nature or is this an environmental thing? Kind of we're nurtured. And the answer, of course, the Bible is, according to the Bible, is both. And the focus here is on nature. Sin and selfishness have saturated our hearts and our motives and our mindset. And this influences us. And of course, when you get a bunch of people like that together on a planet, we're going to create all sorts of environments that reinforce this mindset and direction. Second, it doesn't submit to God's law. So since our human nature puts self at the center, it makes sense that it wouldn't want God's law. The flesh is oriented to the self, which is away from God and others. Well, what's God's law. Jesus summarizes it. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. So, an orientation, or orientation toward the self is the opposite of God's law, and God calls us to get out of ourselves and oriented toward Him and others in a life of love. Third, it can't submit to God's law. So, Paul doesn't just say that this mindset doesn't submit to God. It can't. So, we can't just read this and say, well, it doesn't I mean, it's just saying it doesn't most of the time or some of the time, but it can. I mean, we're mixed, right? Here and there, we're, we can we're submit to God. He's just saying, no, when I say it doesn't submit to God's law, I mean it doesn't at any point, truly, because it can't. It has an inability to truly submit to God. Before coming to Christ, obedience is impossible in the sense that God is asking for, down to our motives with loving God and others. We don't have the ability to submit to God in His ways. Take all the paths and tips and religious practices you want. Do all the self-flagellation you want. You're not going to be able to. Fourth, verse 8 says that the mindset on the flesh can't please God. Our self-centered orientation ultimately taints everything we do. We have a psychological aversion to being primarily devoted to loving and enjoying God, and out of that love, loving others. It's like what Hebrews eleven six 6 said, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because faith, the book of Hebrews continues to argue, is coming to God knowing that He's there and He's a rewarder of those who seek Him. He's a giver. God is a giver of love. We come to Him trusting that. We receive His love and it overflows toward others. That's what faith does. Without that faith, without knowing who God is and trusting that He's a giver and a rewarder of those who seek Him, we won't have the motivational capacity to love Him and others. It's all very strong language, isn't it? Doctrine of original sin is right here. We're all born with a sin nature turned inward. It's crystal clear here and elsewhere in the Bible. Yet we may wonder, could we come to this without the Bible? I mean, yeah, we're looking at the Bible, but could anyone else come to this conclusion? And the answer is actually yes. Listen to what even an atheist philosopher named Thomas Nagel said. He said, it isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right in my belief. It's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. And then listen to what he said. This cosmic authority problem is not a rare condition. So here's an atheist philosopher saying, listen, a pretty common condition is that we don't just not believe in God, we don't want there to be a God because it's an authority issue. He's in charge or, we in, or we're in charge, and we don't like that option. It's the attitude of the realm of the flesh. The attitude in the life of the Spirit of court is implied to be the opposite. When God brings someone to Christ, He transforms them from hostility to love. He changes us so that we want to submit to God's law and we can now actually please Him. So that's the argument of the text. The main point is that obedience moves from an impossibility to not just a possibility, but an inevitability. He supports then this with a series of contrasts. There's two categories of people with two different mindsets that lead to two different destinies and reflect two different attitudes toward God and His ways. And everyone is born in the category of the flesh. You simply cannot trust, love, and obey God if you are in the flesh category, this text is saying, because you have yourself 
on the ruler seat of your life. But salvation is not just being forgiven for this attitude and for the sins that we commit. It involves a transfer of categories. When God brings them, brings someone to Christ, He brings them from one realm to another realm. He transforms us at the core of our personalities, and we will now begin to have a new mindset. We will begin to set our mind on the things of the Spirit when we're in this category. And the obedience that was once impossible due to our motives is now actually possible with new motives working in our hearts. In other words, Paul is arguing the same thing that Jesus did to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Jesus said, you must be born again. No one can see the kingdom of heaven unless he or she is born again. So, let's just consider some implications for how we understand the human condition, for how we think about what it means to be saved, and for our life together as a church. So, first, how does this help us understand the human condition? What does all of this mean for how we understand human nature? Well, just to summarize a few things and press it a little bit deeper, before sin entered the world, our human nature was able to obey God. Adam and Eve had the capacity to obey God. They didn't just, you know, first, second, disobey Him. After sin came, though, our nature has become corrupt, and now we are unable to obey God. The theological term for this is total depravity, or some would use the language of radical depravity. It doesn't mean that everyone is as bad as they can possibly be. It means that every part of us is tainted by sin in these motives of selfishness. So, picture a cup of clean water. Total depravity does not mean that that cup is now just thick sludge. It means that uncleanness has saturated every part of it. It's now uh, clouded and darkened. So, it doesn't mean that everything everyone does is as bad as it could possibly be, but it does mean that every part of us is affected by sin. We are under the rule of sin, and it touches the way we think, the way we feel, what we value, the priority of our loves, how we live, why we do what we do. And because of this, we're not able to obey and please God with pure motives or singular motives. We can call this total inability. We're turned in on ourselves, away from God and others, and we cannot change the bent of our hearts toward God and others on our own. Many people simply don't factor this reality in when they talk about topics like free will. Many people have this idea that our will is just totally free. Uh, we can choose good or bad, and it's just up to us. And they hold this in as like a supreme value. So, I've been in so many conversations of free will, and there's just this assumption out there that like free will is this untouchable, pure reality that we all have. We all have this freedom to just choose good or bad, and it's, it, we're neutral, and we can just do this, and it's completely up to us, and that this is something that we've really got to protect, because if that's not true, then our theology and our worldview implodes. I just heard a professing Christian leader this past week or so say that God loves free will, and He respects free will. They grant that we need a little bit of help, so God gives a bit of grace to everyone to kind of like close the gap of our reach toward loving Him, but then we still have to, on our own, reach out and choose Him and choose the good. The choice is ultimately ours deep down, and God won't influence that. But if we take what we just read this morning seriously, we have to recognize our will is bound. It is under the rule of sin, and it cannot get out on its own. That is not absolute freedom. The Bible does not teach that. Look at verses 7 and 8 again. He says, the mindset of the flesh does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. John Calvin said of this verse, behold the power of free will. That's really helpful um, because in his day, he had a lot of theologians who were talking about the power of free will. And he's just like, look at this verse. Here's the power of free will. 
the mindset of the flesh cannot submit to God's law. It's unable to. It's not a whole lot of power. So if you want the power of free will, then here it is. We have a free will, I want to be clear, in the sense that our will is free to do what we want. It has, we're free to do what we want. The problem is that we can't change our wants. We, God has to transform our wills so that we want Him. The idea of humanity being born morally neutral or good is a really nice thought, but it doesn't map onto reality. Second, how does this help us then understand the nature of salvation? If that's the human condition, what does it mean then to be saved? Well, we see that salvation is necessary. Nobody can change their own hearts. God has to do it, and we need Him to. For Christians, this should lead you to thank God and wonder about the reality that happened inside of you by God in His Holy Spirit. And it should lead us to thank Him, to praise Him, to never lose sight of any time we even have a motive that is truly oriented toward God and others. We're like, thank you for that, Lord. I could not get this on my own. We also see that salvation is transformational. It's not just about God offering forgiveness. It's about God transforming us and actually freeing our wills. Salvation is about getting a freed will. So we can actually now want Him and love Him and choose Him. So when someone becomes a Christian, they're given a new heart, to use the language of the prophets. Now, you may not know exactly when this happens. It's a radical, powerful, transformational moment. It's a, it's a transformation at the core of your desires and your will and your motives and your personality. And over time, you will see the effects of this in your life. You'll start to love God and hate sin. You'll start to obey God rather than yourself. You'll start to say no to your self-oriented motives. But you may not be able to perceive this right away. Some of you can, but I couldn't. I became a Christian, as far as I could tell, when I was 11 at some point. I'm not sure of the hour it happened. I'm not sure of the week or the month it happened. I know the year it happened. And I know that it happened at a point in time. But I don't know exactly when, but I could perceive the effects. Because I went into that year without this kind of motive. Right? I didn't care about God. I didn't know who He was. I'm just doing my thing. And I came out of that year knowing who He was knowing and loving that Jesus died for my sins and rose. And all of a sudden, I'm starting to feel bad about the way that I'm talking to people and taking advantage of them. Conviction of sin and wanting to know what he says in his word. You see the effects of it in your life. In some ways, we can think of this transformation like a seed planted in the heart. Seeds are powerful, aren't they? Amazing. Put that thing under a concrete sidewalk, and it's going to burst through that thing one day, right? Pop right through, grow into this massive tree. But you don't see that effect right away necessarily, right? A little bit of soil's displaced perhaps, and then it'll burst through over time. And we also see that salvation is personal here. This isn't something for us just to learn about and then apply to our lives. This is deeply personal. This, and, and this transfer of realms for every one of us, this has either happened to you or it has not happened to you yet. So ask yourself a question like this. Am I in the flesh, as described by this text, or in the Spirit? Do you have the mindset of the flesh or of the Spirit? Do you find deep down that you are deeply resistant to God and His ways? Or do you love Him because you know He loves you through the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you now able to obey Him by the power of the Spirit? Not perfectly, but you care and you're struggling by His strength? Or are you unable, totally unable to do it? This is not about perfection, but progress. This is just about a reality in our lives. So if you have that, then thank God He has accomplished this miracle in your life. If you don't, then turn to Him. Admit that you need this and that He alone can do it. And you come to Christ. You trust Him for the forgiveness of, his, of sins and for this transformation. Final implications for our church, uh, family, and how we live together. Um, this affects how we think of the nature of the church in the New Testament. Paul's working with this reality of 
the gospel coming with such a power by the Holy Spirit that people are transformed, which is why in church gatherings around the world, and, and we believe that anyone is welcome to be around the church and to come here on Sundays and to te- and attend, um, but the nature of the church, what it means to be a member of a local church, is to acknowledge that this reality has happened to you. The church is for those who have been transferred into the realm of the Spirit, so far as we can tell. This affects how we think of the tone of the church. If this is actually true, that means we will both have a humble, honest awareness of the depth of our sinfulness that's still present in our lives. And we'll get to that in coming weeks because this is a battle. There is still this fleshly impulse at work at Christians. That's just not what Paul's getting at right here. It's a fundamental difference. But we will be honest and aware of just how much we need God, where we'd be apart from Him, and these struggles to us. And we would also have this happy new life together and encourage one another about where we see God at work in each other's lives and marvel at the miracle of being part of this. I marvel when, when I talk to some of you and I, and I think about some of you and I just sit around the room and I think, my goodness, these are some amazing people by the power of the Holy Spirit and they are not who they used to be. And I'm not who I used to be. I'm still a mess, but I'm not who I used to be. Praise God. Um, and so this should affect our tone and our expectation and our joy together. And Jesus calls us then also to let this affect our mission. Shine your light in the world so that the world will see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Real good works, with, with empowered by the Holy Spirit, with new motives. Jesus is assuming this is powerful and, and real because he brought the kingdom of God and he's bringing these new hearts. And so he's saying, enjoy it and shine. And so, if this is real, then we need to know that everybody needs this transformation. This is why we send missionaries to the unreached people groups. There's no one sitting out there on a desert island who's seeking God and converted apart from Christ. There's no second chance after death. This is why it's urgent, because this is the human condition, and we have the message, and the Spirit uses the message. And so, we gladly, joyfully live to shine our light uh, before others and pray that the Spirit will work. So, obedience was impossible. Now it's not just possible, it's inevitable. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for letting us not just hear about this reality from your word, but live in light of it and experience this. And so, we together join our hearts to praise you right now for this, and we pray that you would keep working We pray that you would take our hearts and keep conforming them and transforming them and that one by one you would take more people in this room and draw them to our church family and our lives through the week to hear the gospel of Jesus from our mouths and that you would give new hearts and that we would welcome them with the welcome we've received by the Lord Jesus. Amen.